Great to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that uh, very nice introduction. Boy, I, it just sounds like a, I'm a very busy guy, it sounds like. Well, you're looking at a picture of me. This is uh, Jerry Robinson, Austrian economist, and as he said, a former financial planner. I don't do that anymore, uh, but I do run the FTM Daily website, ftmdaily.com. Follow the money daily is what it stands for. Okay, we're going to go into some economics. I was really enjoying the last presenter talking about trading ideas. We do that here as well at FTM Daily. Uh, we do a lot of that stuff, currency uh, monitoring and all of this. You know, you can find out all the, that stuff at our website. But today I want to talk about some geopolitics and some economics and how they relate to you. Uh, now, many of you may already know what I'm going to be talking about, but I want to talk about the uh, connection that the United States dollar has to your investing, and not just the normal uh, inflation is coming kind of scare, but instead more of uh, the background or the history of this. Uh, so first of all, we should talk about the national debt, and the national debt stands at approximately 17.5. Actually, it's gone up since then. Uh, this slide is probably about two months old. But it shows here that uh, the federal government owes $17.5 trillion. But that's not the big problem. That's the, uh, that's the part that you can see. Uh, the part below the water are the unfunded liabilities, $128 trillion to be exact. And that, of course, is staring us in the face. We have to pay for it, and the United States government has zero in savings ready to pay for that. So that means that you and I are going to have to be bearing the brunt of this, and of course our children and our grandchildren are going to be dealing with this mountain of debt. Uh, we have absolutely no debt ceiling currently. It's an absolute tragedy. And of course when you think about um, the Medicare, the Medicaid, the Social Security, and all of the other, uh, the warfare and welfare state, as they are often called, financing these things have bankrupted America. Uh, it's not that we're going to go bankrupt. This is not a future tense statement. We are bankrupt. We don't have enough money to pay our own bills. We paid out $2 trillion last year in entitlements. Uh, the government paid out $2 trillion to its citizens last year. That's unsustainable considering that our tax revenue is uh, not even double that. So we are in a very dangerous place economically speaking. Now, here is a picture of a 1928 silver dollar. Uh, this is what the dollars used to look like. You walk into a, uh, into perhaps a, uh, a pawn shop or something like that, and you'll find these, or even a coin dealer, you'll find these. And these are novelties. But you'll notice what it says at the very top. It says, silver certificate. This certifies that there has been deposited in the treasury of the United States of America one silver dollar payable to the bearer on demand. That means if you did not like the direction that your country was going, if you did not like the direction that the economy uh, was going, then you could go ahead and take these pieces of paper that were completely worthless and you could trade them in for something that backed them up, such as, in this case, silver. But today, we have been robbed of all of that thanks to our Federal Reserve. At the very top of this note, you'll see that it says no longer silver certificate, but instead, Federal Reserve note, and it even goes on to say this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. We call this a fiat currency because it is issued by fiat or by decree, and that's exactly where we find ourselves today. And of course, this is what we have seen as, and this is a bit comical here, but in, re in reality, we have just been printing money to solve our problems. The unfortunate thing that most Americans I guess are not familiar with, and you know that financial education is at a very low state today, as is most education. And what we find today is that money itself is debt. As I told you before, you saw at the very top of that dollar bill, your modern dollar bill, you can pull one out of your pocket and look at it, it says Federal Reserve Note. Now if I tell you I have a car note, you would say to me what? You have a car loan. Of course, that's what I would have. But if I have a Federal Reserve Note, what makes me think that that's an asset? That's not an asset. It's actually a liability. It's a, it's a note issued by the Federal Reserve that must come back to the Federal Reserve with interest. It is on loan. So we borrow our money from the Federal Reserve, which is an independent institution, and then we have to uh, then 
uh, pay the money back with interest. And who sets the interest rate? The Federal Reserve, of course. So the dollar's days are numbered. This is a very bad system that we've developed here. The fiat currency uh, system that we have today is not the kind of system that is a sustainable system. That's why you're seeing things like Bitcoin rise up and you're seeing people moving towards gold and silver. You may not like the reality that the dollar is not here forever, but the point of the, or the matter is, is that it cannot last. No currency can last forever. Otherwise, all of us would still be using Roman denarii. But of course, we're not. So currencies rise and currencies fall just the same way that empires rise and empires fall. In 1944, there was something known as the Bretton Woods uh, Institution or the Bretton Woods uh, Conference. And it was held at Mount Washington in New Hampshire in uh, Bretton Woods. And at this, uh, at this meeting, uh, which was held in the post-World War II era, uh, a, an entirely new global order was established. And prior to this time, the British pound had played a major role in global commerce. But at, the, uh, at this meeting, it was determined that war-torn Europe would need to turn to the United States to serve as the, uh, the hegemon or the global reserve currency. And so the United States, as we hear in history, reluctantly took upon that upon their shoulders to lead the world economy. And the way that they did that was they were the intermediary between the currencies of the world and gold. And so no longer was all, were all currencies going to be backed by gold, but instead the U.S. dollar would be backed by gold, and then all other currencies would be backed by the dollar, which was backed by gold. And so the United States played middleman. Now, you can imagine what this did for the United States. We look back and we, we think about American innovation, and there's no doubt that America has been innovative. We look back and we see uh, how America has grown over the last several decades, and there's no doubt that there has been a strong entrepreneurial type of drive within America, but we had some help. And that help came in the form of the Bretton Woods Arrangement. And that Bretton Woods Arrangement, in essence, created a strong demand for our dollar. In other words, everybody around the world considered the dollar to be as good as gold. Therefore, it took the demand off of gold and placed it instead upon something that's not so much of a relic, and that is a paper dollar. So people began to demand dollars instead of gold. It took a while for people to finally move away from gold. It was a, it was a thing that everybody was used to. It was what they trusted up until that time. But over time, we have now seen the dollar replace the piece of gold. And that's unfortunate because the United States has been able to now print them and print them and print them to the point now where we have the huge debt. Much of the spending which we could always point back to the 1940s, but let's point to the 1960s for the sake of time and talk about the massive deficit spending that occurred there. Uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, his Great Society programs, uh, the war on, on poverty, which has cost us trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars, and we have very little to show for it. Of course, the Vietnam War, which uh, was a huge hole in our pocket, and of course, this began to stir other nations, especially in Europe, France and Germany in particular, to say, can the United States really back up its claim? Does it have enough gold to back up all of these dollars that they have created? We're not sure. And so France and Germany and many other nations began to come back to the United States and say, you know what, we're going to trade you some of these paper dollars that are sitting in our vaults that you fooled us into holding, and we want to instead have our gold back, so we want to trade these for gold. And that happened for a period of time. And of course, that was a major drag for the uh, for LBJ's uh, you know uh, you know presidency, and as well as as Nixon's. Uh, Nixon finally decides to uh, do something rash, which is now called the Nixon shock. And it was on August 15, 1971, while you were sitting down watching the Bonanza show, Nixon's ugly head showed up on the TV and had to say this. He said that he was no longer going to be allowing nations to convert their paper dollars into gold. 
Now, to people like you and me who are sitting at home watching television, what does that matter, right? Who cares that these countries cannot trade their currency, their, their dollars in for gold? We lost that ability a long time ago. We lost that ability back in the 30s whenever uh, FDR uh, issued the, uh, the requirement that basically made it illegal to hold gold right? in 1933. So here we have the Nixon shock. And the Nixon shock was heard around the world that all nations now could no longer take their paper dollars and simply convert them to gold on the international exchange. Now, this of course caused a dramatic loss of faith in the United States, as you can imagine. And many nations who were already trying to move out of the dollar back to gold uh, caused a lot of problems for the U.S. economy in the early 70s. And this is what was, de this is what was decided, in essence that uh, Nixon and Kissinger would meet with the Saudis, who we already had a great relationship with from back in the 1940s, whenever FDR and King Abdulaziz had met on the US, USS Quincy, uh, and they had brokered a deal where they would get reasonable oil uh, in exchange for military protection. Well, Nixon wanted to ratchet this up a little bit. He decided that we, and by the way, Nixon was a brilliant strategist. He was a brilliant president regardless of his uh, downfall. He was very brilliant as was his Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. And these two concocted what had to be one of the one of the best uh, sleight of hand moves and in reality they may not have known how good it was going to work. But in essence Saudi Arabia which had found oil back in the 1930s uh, had, had uh, suddenly realized that it had a lot of oil in this ground and so Nixon and Kissinger decided to broker a deal with the Saudis that said all of the oil that comes up out of your ground must be priced in US dollars. Uh, so if anybody wants to come to you, make them convert their currency into dollars. That's a very important step. Well, this of course led to a renewed demand for the, for the United States dollar, which was lagging because of the broken down Petra, uh, 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 Bretton Woods system. And so this was a fantastic deal for both the United States and for uh, Saudi Arabia. And again, what the Saudi Arabians received out of this, and this is very relevant to what's happening geopolitically today, is the fact that they would receive weapons and military protection, uh, and often uh, from Israel. Uh, that's, what, that's one of the things that they were very concerned about. By 1975, all OPEC nations had shifted to the petrodollar system. They figured, hey, if all we have to do is price our oil in dollars and the US is going to give us weapons, well, of course we'll do that, right? Let's definitely do that. So by 1975, the entire Gulf region and many of uh, other states in the Middle East were getting weapons and getting m promises of military protection and preferential treatment by the United States. And in exchange, they were just taking US dollars for their oil. How did that benefit us again? Remember, if you want to have a one million dollar house, how much money has to be in the economy? Well, at least one million dollars, right? But preferably a lot more, otherwise that's the only asset in the world. So the more money that you can put into the system, the higher values of assets can go. That's why uh, the United States wanted the ability to print as much money as it possibly could, and that created the illusion of prosperity. Look, my 401k is now 200000 not 100000 Or my house is now worth more. Or look, I just got a raise. Everything goes up. This is, the, this is the disease of the present must be the minimum. So the idea here in this fiat-based economy that has no backing in anything like gold is that we simply must see higher asset prices every single year. It's built into this broken down system. Well, the, the more demand around the world, the more dollars are required. And so as more people began to buy more oil from the Gulf region, this created an immense demand for dollars, which, of course, the Federal Reserve was ready to print and provide. The government's official story on 9-11 was that 15 Saudi Arabians boarded commercial jet airliners and slammed them into the World Trade Center. And we went after and hung a guy by the name of Saddam Hussein who lived in Iraq. 
No mention of Saudi Arabia, no mention of anything about Saudi Arabia, uh, not the fact that Osama bin Laden himself was connected to the, uh, the, uh, the uh, bin Laden family who was very close to the House of Saud. Uh, for all kinds of reasons, uh, we were told we needed to go to Iraq instead. Well, what had Iraq done? Well, they had committed a very grave sin that Iran had committed uh, even before them. And that was on September 24, 2000, Saddam Hussein had emerged from a meeting with his leaders and had told the UN that it was ready, finally ready, to make a shift from the petrodollar. It had decided that it was going to go instead with an upstart currency called the euro. And they were only going to take euros for the dollar. This was the very first regime in the, uh, in the Middle East to really go full throttle with this. And that came in the year 2000. Uh, there were, and of course, you know what happened, you know the rest of the story. Uh, can you think of any other nations that don't like the dollar? You would think of Iran, you would think of Syria, you would think of North Korea, you would think of all of the axis of evil nations that were so eager to spread democracy to. Back in the 1980s, of course, Ronald Reagan had the Taliban. These guys were the, the uh, freedom fighters back in the 80s, now they're the Taliban. Uh, and, of course, Reagan was meeting with these guys in the White House, calling them the equivalents of America's founding fathers. This is the petrodollar system. This is what has been created through this insidious system that now controls our currency. Now, of course, uh, there was a pipeline that was supposed to be going through Afghanistan uh, after, well, it was actually in the 1990s, and due to a lot of violence that was going on in Afghanistan, this very important uh, India to Turkmenistan pipeline was shut was shut down, and of course uh, they have, are still trying to get this whole thing uh, rebuilt. You can even see that uh, May 13, 2002, Afghanistan plans gas pipeline. Uh, right now, uh, Iran is also trying to do something very similar. So there's a lot of pipeline politics that's going on in the Middle East. China is moving away from the U.S. dollar. Uh, you're hearing headlines today uh, constantly about how Russia is trying to move away from the U.S. dollar. And then there's, of course, an axis which is called the BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And what they're doing is, is they're choosing to stock up on gold. Iran has moved away from the U.S. dollar. And, of course, you have all of these bases around Iran, uh, and, and it's, probably not, it's probably not hard to understand why, uh, they might be a little concerned about our military, as we are theirs. Syria has moved away from the U.S. dollar. But Saudi Arabia may, remains faithful to the U.S. dollar. And this is the key for investors in the audience today. I think if you're concerned about the U.S. dollar, if you're concerned about the future of the economy, if you're concerned about the overall economy as going forward, one of the key areas in my own analysis, and I believe in many others' analysis to watch, is the stability of Saudi Arabia. Uh, as we mentioned, Saudi Arabia has been coming under fire even as recently as uh, President Barack Obama's UN speech uh, yesterday. Uh, we know that 15 of the 19 hijackers on 9-11 were from Saudi Arabia. They have very few rights there. Possessing a Bible or a crucifix is illegal. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, evangelization, all forms of dissent are prohibited. Converts to, uh, converts to Christianity are given three days to repent. Nuclear weapons are being pursued. And democracy and freedom are a distant dream. And those are our friends. Those are our friends in the Middle East. Now, the reason that they're our friends is because they take the dollar. But the minute that they stop taking the dollar, I can promise you that all of, all of a sudden this uh, cozy relationship is going to shift. And we are concerned about a shift in this petrodollar system. So let's just talk real quickly about what would happen if oil producing nations like Saudi Arabia decided to move to the euro or decided to move to some other currency besides the US dollar. What would happen? Well, let's just create a scenario. Foreign nations would begin to send a flood of US dollars back to the US. You see, they hold them now because they need them to buy oil. Well, in this scenario, foreign nations would not need them any longer. Therefore, they would be coming back here to the United States. The Federal Reserve would lose their ability to print more dollars. After all, you need a strong global demand to uphold a strong supply. And of course, if they don't have that global demand that's constant due to this petrodollar system, they'll lose their ability to print 
uh, as a solution to economic crises. And so this is a sticky problem. The Fed will lose its ability to print more dollars to solve our problems. This, of course, would lead to the U.S. Tre Treasury Secretary and the Federal Reserve Chairman to meet, obviously, to determine the best course of action. And that action would involve an immediate and, and dramatic increase in interest rates. After all, that's how you slow the bleeding. If you're driving down the road and you see that a bank has a 5% CD for 36 months, I would slam the brakes on. I don't know about you. I would rush my money in there. However, if they advertise a 0% interest rate, I'm going to keep my money in the mattress. And that's exactly how the Federal Reserve manipulates the economy. If they want people to spend and they want them to not put money in the bank, they lower interest rates, and that's where we are today. However, if they want us to put money back into the bank, if they want to get money out of the system because they're fearful that there's too much of it, then they raise interest rates, and that has an immediate uh, giant sucking sound on the economy, and money sucks into the banking system, and it stays there because they want that higher interest. And so that's what the United States would have to do. But if you raise interest rates in our current environment, I think we all agree that would probably be a not, not be a very good thing. Uh, hyperinflation would ensue temporarily. I don't see a, a very long period of hyperinflation, but a period of hyperinflation nonetheless uh, would ensue temporarily. And oil-related prices here in the United States would reach outrageous levels. Uh, Washington would soon realize that the total amount of money in the system would have to be dramatically slashed even further, leading to an even higher increase in interest rates. And of course, we would get into all kinds of uh, political uh, conspiracy theories, no doubt. But in the end, both political parties would seek to blame the Federal Reserve, which they never talk about currently. During the entire 2012 presidential debates between Obama and Mr. Romney, the Federal Reserve came up a grand whopping total of zero times, despite the fact that they were spiking the economy with $1 trillion in uh, money every single year. Uh, if you have adjustable rate debts underneath this scenario, you're going to get crushed. Massive, massive layoffs also are going to occur underneath a scenario like this. Asset prices across the board would plummet in value, obviously, because you don't have the excessive amount of currency in the system. Uh, in the end, what's going to inevitably happen is that we're going to have to come back down to earth. The asset prices are simply too high amid the financial carnage and economic recovery would begin to take place, a real one. But it would be a tremendously smaller economy due to a drastically reduced money supply. And so in the Middle East, we really face a moral dilemma. It's like Thomas Jefferson said about slavery. He said, but as it is, we have the wolf by the ear, and we can either hold him nor safely let him go. Justice is in one scale, and self-preservation is in the other. So we know we've got ourselves into a tango in the Middle East. It's a, all kinds of a, a, of a nightmare. But if we simply leave, we're going to be leaving our economic power because our economic power is rooted and grounded in the petrodollar system that creates a vast amount of global demand for the U.S. dollar. And if we simply let that go, then it's going to be a very uh, negative thing. Only fools argue about the bill here. So if we do find ourselves in a situation like that, it would be pointless to try to, to find out who is to blame for it. We would just want to be prepared. We wrote a book on this topic, and in fact, we covered a whole lot of information in this book. It was a best-selling book. Uh, it was on all kinds of programs. You may have even seen it. Uh, and it's called Bankruptcy of Our Nation. And it covers this and many, many, many other topics. So if you're interested in this topic, if you're interested in learning more about uh, this topic of the economy, then I would urge you to pick up a copy of Bankruptcy of Our Nation. It's available in stores. Uh, it's available, of course, online or at our website uh, at ftmdaily.com. Now, what I told you up to this point was all, and I'm, I'm just about to close here, um, what I've told you up to this point was all about the problem. Well, here at our website, we're not just focused on the problem. We're focused on creating solutions. And what I want to show you today, real briefly, is something we have created here for people who want to have a holistic uh, source of information about many different topics related to their finances. A, this is really a do-it-yourself kit for investors. What we do is we provide you with daily stock trading ideas every single day. I've been trading in the markets now for 17 years, 
and uh, love trading the markets, love trading stocks, tra options, currencies, commodities, whatever the case might be. But I, I really do like trading stocks and ETFs. And so what we do is, is we use our own system. It's called the trigger trade system. And it puts out very high probability trading ideas. We put out one, our favorite one, every single day. We also provide you with our exclusive market barometer alert system. This system tracks the market and tells you whether it's in an uptrend, a downtrend, or a you know it's under pressure. And this is a fantastic uh, market barometer that kept us out of the market uh, crash in 2008. It won't get you out right uh, as soon as the, the market begins to fall. It'll get you out within a few days of it. And that's really what you want to miss because you look at these very long sustained downturns in the market. If we face one of those, you'll want to be in the early uh, exit phase, not in the very, very end, like many people who sold at the very bottom in 2009 and then didn't buy back until recently. Now that's, that's just not a good thing. So this market barometer is designed to keep you in the market when, thing, when times are good and keep, get you out of the market when you really shouldn't be there. We also put out a newsletter every single quarter and you get four issues of that. We also have a PACE portfolio. Uh, four of my favorite asset classes are precious metals, agriculture, commodities, and energy. And several years ago, I created a portfolio that tracks my favorite stocks in each one of those areas. And then we cushion it with a um, nice number of dividend-paying stocks, uh, globally diversified, that will protect us um, you know, from some of the volatility that's inherent in these uh, commodity-based stocks. Now, this portfolio has beat the S&P 500. Uh, fairly consistently, and it's uh, it's not too terribly aggressive, but I think that you'll enjoy it. Uh, and then also, in addition to all that, you'll receive ETF trend reports. We 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 track nine different uh, global currencies every month with a buy, sell, or hold rating. We track 60 ETFs globally, uh, and in uh, commodity ETFs every single month uh, with a buy, sell, or hold. Uh, and then of course we uh, we have a live monthly conference call. Uh, we also have an income university with 22 different income streams that people can create both now and in retirement. Uh, you get a copy of our book. You get exclusive commentaries and emails from me. And all of that, as I said, is only $199 per year or $19.95 per month. And we have a 100% money-back guarantee. So if this sounds even remotely like something that might benefit you, if you want to know how to trade some of these different ideas, if you are concerned about the overall economy and you want to have a good balance of information about it, it's not scare tactic, but it's also uh, been proven to do well in the markets, then I would urge you to check this out. You can go to ftmdaily.com or just type in followthemoney.com. Either way, you'll get right there to our home page and just click on the uh, subscribe button. And you would simply want to subscribe. And, uh, and, I, and you can actually just click on this, I think it says shop, click on the shop button. And when you're there, you'll see the FTM Insider uh, page. So there you, there you have it. Uh, there is our website, ftmdaily.com. I really enjoyed this uh, time, and I don't know if I have any time left, but if so, uh, I will be happy to entertain just a couple of questions. Let me see here. Uh, J.C. Holder, uh, I have some of those silver certificates. Yes, uh, guess they are no longer redeemable in silver. No, if you take them into the bank now, you'll get laughed out, uh, J.C., but uh, they're good for uh, keepsake. You can show your kids and grandkids how money used to be worth something. Isn't the USA just about energy independence? And then likely to be a net exporter of oil, which means the world will come to us for oil. That would change the issue. Yes, that's very true. Yeah, that is very true. Absolutely. Uh, but that also uh, throws a kink into the, the, the entire system because then the United States becomes a prime competitor with Saudi Arabia. And that's not really a good way to treat your friends. And so that's the issue that's currently with, between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia is they're concerned about us because we have all this oil uh, that we may be able to export and we're going to be competing with them. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, Steve, yes, absolutely. The question is, is a viable defense against these trends getting into 
uh, manageable debt with low interest long term loans yes uh, you know the lower risk lower interest big mortgages I, I think I think that's okay uh, trading your cash for cash flow uh, is a really smart idea and that's something we teach over and over again I like that uh, I like that idea uh, the question is aren't we entering a deflationary period instead of an inflationary period well that'll be the that'll be the ultimate uh, that'll be the ultimate situation uh, yes I absolutely agree with you uh, unfortunately well I guess it's I guess it's fortunately we will experience a time of inflationary pressure as many of these dollars that are out there seek a home and as they come back uh, that'll create some inflation but I don't again I don't think it'll be a very long period and that of course will be followed by deflation and a, a kind of a sustained long uh, period of deflation which again you can always make money in any kind of market so we don't look at these trends and say oh what woe is me I guess we shouldn't do. no we should definitely be prepared but we just need to be prepared in a smart way and realize that we might have to change our paradigm on some things as they happen I know I've had some paradigm shifting moments over the last several years I don't know about you and I think it's very important to us as investors to be flexible and, and uh, you know and pliable uh, as new realities are taking shape. All right. <laughs> okay, I won't read that comment, but uh, I do see it, Jim. And uh, interesting comment. Any other questions at all? Yes, historical performance. Uh, you can go to, uh, let's see here, if you go to our website, actually, you know what? That's a great question. We do have data. If you go to our website and shoot me an email, I'll send you some. We do have some online, but I don't know the exact URL right now. So, and you might not be able to find it from our front page. But yes, we do. If you search, if you search for it, you'll find it. Or if you email me, I'll send it, I'll send you the link. That's probably a good one to memorize, huh? Any other questions at all? Is it wise to buy gold and silver? I think it's wise to buy gold and silver if you have a long time horizon. If you're buying it as insurance and not as some kind of speculative investment that you think is going to make you wild and rich. And if you're doing it because you are wanting to have some diversification in your portfolio and you know that it can be volatile at times, if you understand all of those things, I think silver and gold are some of the best things that you can have exposure to. Personally, the way that I have my, uh, my finances set up, I'm a bit open about this, maybe I shouldn't be, but I, I'll just tell you how I do it. I do it in thirds. One third real estate, and I like to hold rental real estate that uh, that is in good areas not expensive I don't like the real expensive stuff the stuff that I can flip in a heartbeat if I have to because I have to get out of town I like the I put one-third in rental real estate that's good stuff it doesn't matter if it's uh, you know single-family homes or uh, you know or uh, storage facilities you know whatever the case might be and then well, that's one-third the next third is uh, stocks I have stocks for my retirement, so I'm invested in stocks, but I'm not going to put all my money in stocks. I put one third in there. And then the final third I put into what we call our, our PACE, uh, so our PACE portfolio. These are you know, more physical, commodity type of assets. So I guess I'm exposed 33% or maybe 50% to the actual market itself, and then the other 50% is in hard things that you can feel and touch, like real estate and gold and silver and diamonds and things like that. Uh, I, we cover all of that. Uh, well, we don't cover all of that, but we cover a lot of those uh, concepts in the book Bankruptcy of Our Nation. I tell you, if you don't want to start with a $20 a month uh, subscription, I totally get it, but at least go pick up the book uh, if this made any sense to you today. It'll really open up your eyes, and we put a lot of investing ideas in there, so I think you would really enjoy it. Uh, Bankruptcy of Our Nation. Uh, I think the question is, do I think gold is still going lower? maybe even down to 450 an ounce. Wow, David. Uh, I haven't heard uh, 450 as a projection, but that's uh, 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 oh, for, for the, uh, the offer. Okay, if you're on the website, ftmdaily.com, what you're going to do is you're going to click the, well, you can do one of two things. You can either go ftmdaily.com forward slash subscribe, and that'll take you right to the page that you need to be on so you can see everything. Or you can just click on the shop button in the menu, 
and just go down and find the FTM Insider. And you can see all of our different products and services there when you click on the shop button. No, I don't think that gold is going to go down that low. Uh, what I do think is that uh, there's a lot of pressure on gold right now because the dollar has been so strong. And in fact, the dollar is, is at, a, at a place that it hasn't been in over a year, uh, ever since July 1st. It was almost like that. I don't know if you guys saw that Stansberry doom and gloom thing about July 1st that was, you know, the, the, the fact is going to destroy the dollar. Literally, the day that he said the dollar might start going down, it just went straight north. And I don't know if it was the Stansberry curse or whatever it was, but the dollar has just been soaring. Uh, and, of course, it's putting a lot of pressure on things that are priced in U.S. dollars, like gold and silver and oil. And that's why you're seeing that. But things move in cycles. And so eventually the, you know, the dollar will come back down and all of those other assets will move back up. So once you begin to kind of discern that, you can begin to exploit it with your own investments. I love to use ETFs uh, and you know, trade oil with USO or I trade uh, gold with PHYS. I like to trade silver with SIVR. I like to uh, trade gold mining with GDX and GDXJ. I like to trade silver mining with SIL. And there's a lot of great ETFs out there that you can trade many different uh, asset classes very easy um, and get exposure to them and just watch the dollar. You know, when the dollar is really strong, uh, you know, then just kind of bide your time. And when the dollar begins to fall, you begin to uh, scoop up those assets and trade them, swing trade them. Been doing that for years. Well, the dollar may get stronger in a deflationary period, David. That's, that's very true, but that won't really matter if there's less of them. But the point is, is there'll be less of them, and that's, that's the part that's going to hurt people like you and I because uh, without these perpetually growing asset prices, then you're, you're in a really bad place because everybody's anticipating higher asset prices next year than they had this year. And that's an unsustained. You go back through history, and you don't see that. You don't see assets growing and growing and growing based upon paper money. That's just, that's not real. That's not reality. That's not how things have always been. This is a very new time. But, of course, we're bending the laws of economics. The Federal Reserve is trying to bend the laws of economics. Peter Thiel, who is the CEO or former CEO of PayPal, um, he uh, is trying to eradicate death, right? He's taken on death and says, I'm going to eradicate it. So we're in this time frame where everybody's trying to bend the laws, the known laws, I think a lot of it's going gonna, it's gonna to come back to get us because we can't break these laws, and, and uh, maybe we'll have some victories. But I think in the end, we'll have to simply realize that these laws have been in existence for 6,000, 7,000, however long the, the Earth's been here, and we're going to have to learn to deal with it. Um, and exploiting them you know, may blow up in our face. Uh, also, I should tell you, when you go to ftmdaily.com, uh, if you like the stuff we've been talking about, go check out our radio show. Every single week we do a radio show, a podcast. It's called Follow the Money Weekly. And you can find that on our website. Just go to ftmdaily.com forward slash FTM Weekly. FTM Weekly. And there you can get uh, our weekly podcast downloaded to your RSS or iTunes or whatever you do. Uh, yeah, we've been doing that show for a long time. Have some great interviews on there for people. If you want to go back and look at some of the archives, we've interviewed some greats, some great people. Uh, Ty Ann says, uh, "What do you think about forex with the China USD pair?" We, currently, we we like the Chinese yuan. Um, we, we just turned it green in our global currency monitor product, and that's pretty much the only green currency that we see for actually investing. But as far as trading uh, the dollar and, and the Chinese yuan, I think that uh, I think it's good. I don't I don't do that a whole lot. I usually use currency ETFs, and I hold them. So um, the way that my save so so my investments I told you are split up: real estate, stocks, and pace. Well, my savings I keep six months of liquid savings at all times at all times saving not investments. It's not for investing. It's just savings. And what I do in that savings is I have one-third in foreign currencies, one-third in gold and silver, and then one-third in U.S. dollar denominated assets. That's called our DSL model. You can learn about that by going to ftmdaily.com forward slash DSL. And uh, that will explain we have a historical data on that, how it's performed. 
And that's how I keep my savings, and I use currencies for that purpose. Okay, I think it's probably time. Uh, Reed, this has really been enjoyable. Thank you for having me here.